Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? I'm ready for the event. WTMJ TV, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. WTMJ TV, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Charles Benson with WTMJ TV. How do you hear me? Hello, Charles. Jeff here, and I have you loud and clear. Well, good morning, Jeff Williams from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. How are we looking from space? Well, it's been a few days since I've seen Wisconsin, since we've passed over in the daytime, but uh, last pass, you looked great. It, it was uh, a late spring uh, morning, and uh, the weather was clear. I don't know how it is now. How is it now? It's actually a beautiful morning in Wisconsin. I want to ask you, on Monday, uh, you made history by going inside the world's first inflatable living room in space. I think it, they officially call it the beam. It looked like the ultimate tent. What is it, and why is it important to the future of space travel? Well, it's new technology. The, as you uh, mentioned, the inflatable module uh, is something new to us. Uh, it's something that brings a lot of efficiency with a lot of potential in the future because you can launch something that's smaller in volume on perhaps a smaller rocket and then inflate it to get the volume that we need. The space station is very big and we use the, the entire volume. It's the size of a 5,000 square foot house. Uh, so it's, it's, and it took uh, almost 40 space shuttle flights, 37 I think, and an equal number of Russian rocket launches to get it into orbit. So to be able to have something uh, volumetrically more efficient to get into space is uh, very promising. And that's the purpose of the International Space Station, to uh, one of the purposes anyway, is to prove out new technologies for future exploration. I think you described it as being cold inside. How could that be for a guy who grew up in winter Wisconsin? Well, cold is always relative. It was when I came in or went into the B module, it was cooler than the station. Uh, we are very much climate controlled here, um, but it had no heaters on it and uh, it had no climate control before I went into it. So it was more of a comment. Actually, it was a little refreshing. It was like a nice uh, fall uh, day in, uh, in Wisconsin. Give me a sense of where you are now. What is around you? Well, I'm in uh, one of the laboratory modules on board. This is the Japanese module. Uh, so I'm at the very forward end, and if, if we were, we're heading in this direction, so I'm uh, kind of the left wing at the forward end of the space station. Uh, and if I were to go behind the camera and take a right turn, I could go uh, almost 300 feet uh, through the station, down through uh, different modules, the U.S. laboratory, um, a couple of other U.S. modules, um, and then get into the Russian segment uh, and the Russian laboratory modules as well. So it's a, it's a huge space station. The space station has traveled roughly 2.6 billion miles. It's orbited the Earth more than 100 times. What's the future for the space station? What new things can we learn from the space station? Well, I think we'll continue to learn the things that, we're, uh, that we've been endeavored to, to study here for already uh, many years, uh, over 15 years. Um, the space station affords us a very unique uh, laboratory environment in a weightless environment. So. Uh, we've got uh, science experiments across the spectrum of the different science uh, disciplines that have been going on for the life of the station and will continue to go on well into the 2020s, um, according to the current plan. Also, we have, like we, met, we talked about the BEAM a couple minutes ago, proven out technologies uh, for future exploration. This is a great platform to be able to do that. And finally, uh, I would offer um, that we don't 
understand completely the impacts on the human body uh, in this weightless environment, the environment of space. So we are guinea pigs ourselves while we're up here. So many of the experiments that we're conducting are on ourselves to try to understand the impacts in this environment on the human body and to mitigate those adverse impacts, uh, again, to support future exploration out of low Earth orbit, whether, whether it be to the moon or to Mars or elsewhere. Uh, what's it like to be weightless? It's, it's fun to watch you there as the microphone can be floating, you're floating. How long does it take to get used to that? Well, you acclimate uh, very quickly in a few days, but I would say it takes most people on their first flight, their first time here, about six weeks to get very comfortable working in the environment where the logical up or down is no longer up or down. You can turn sideways, you can turn upside down and make anything a logical up and down. Uh, the challenges, of course, um, um, come with losing things very easily. Like you said, I can let go of this microphone and continue talking, but it can drift away and it's soon out of sight. And I can tell you uh, over the, the length of time that I've been here, the multiple flights, I've lost many things. Thankfully, you eventually find them. They usually drift into a, an inlet filter in the ventilation system. Uh, and they're caught by a filter, and that's where we usually go look for lost items, at least the, the first place we look. That sounds very cool. Uh, give me a sense. Are you allowed to bring any personal items from home? And if so, did you bring anything from Wisconsin? We do bring some personal items. Uh, I uh, bring, of course, uh, photographs um, of family. Um, and a few close friends, um, little trinket kind of things. I've, I've brought jewelry up here for my wife and my daughters-in-law um, and other things like that. Um, I bought, uh, brought flags, uh, U.S. flags, Wisconsin flags, U.S. Army flags. I spent my whole career in the Army. Um, so things like that. It's not a whole lot. We're, uh, we're limited to uh, 1.5 kilograms on the Soyuz. Uh, Soyuz, as you uh, probably know, is very small. So we don't uh, have a lot of room to put things. Uh, so uh, logically, it limits us uh, uh, like that. Jeff, we have people on Facebook listening to this right now. We had a question from Meredith who wants to know, how close to the moon are you? Well, let's see. We're not any closer to the moon than you are really where we orbit the earth and our altitude above the earth is a, a roughly 250 miles and as i recall the moon is something like 240,000 miles away i might have that number wrong but that's uh, what my memory uh, recalls at the moment uh, so it's it's uh, you know orders of magnitude beyond where we are right now we're very close to the earth we can go to the window we can see the entire globe but uh, you, uh, you, you very close, you can see the details on the Earth. And of course, I've sent down, uh, and we've all sent down much photography showing the details of the Earth. So really not any closer than you are. We have about 30 seconds left. Give me a sense of that spectacular view of Mother Earth that you see every day. And the sheer beauty must be amazing, but is it also a spiritual experience for you? Oh, it's uh, incredibly moving to be able to view the part of God's creation we call Earth, which is our home, and to see that it is habitable, that it is inhabited. You see all kinds of details, like I said, natural features as well as man-made features. So I spent a lot of time in the window uh, with uh, things like this, a camera, uh, trying to capture that view for the people on Earth to be able to virtually bring everybody to this, uh, this orbital outpost we call the International Space Station. Jeff Williams, I can't thank you enough for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, safe travels, and uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event.